Hello, hello, and welcome back. Welcome back to our last session of the day, Opportunities Around Crypto Adoption for Financial Institutions. As you can see, Maya is back with her Christmas uh, headphones, is it? Headphones? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever it is to warm your ears. That's nice because it's almost Christmas. Welcome, Mariana. Welcome, Kim. Welcome, Simon. And yeah, the stage is yours. Enjoy. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, Victoria. <laughs> hey, um, guys, it's the last session of the day. Um, a long day at, at the UBC. And uh, as I said, I was trying to, uh, to um, cheer up the people who have been uh, listening to the UBC for a whole day. They might be a bit tired. Uh, I like to claim they're my wireless uh, Christmas um, headphones, but they're not. They're just earmuffs. So I'll take them off. Otherwise, I won't hear you. But uh, listen, it's a complete pleasure, real pleasure, Mariana, to uh, to be talking to you again, um, Kim and Simon. Um, I think is is this um, your first time attending the European Blockchain Convention? Um, I no, I attended last April. Last year. Yes. Okay, very good. Yeah. And you, Simon? I think same for me. I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm a bit ill. Um, but yeah, I attended last time as well. As well, fantastic. Very good. So we're not completely newbies. So you know what it's like. Um, it's great. It's great that it's uh, virtual. It's great to have all the many people actually logging in. What's not so nice is that if this was uh, in, in unusual times, we'll probably be meeting in Barcelona. It's the last panel of the day. We'll have a chat, and then we we'll go off and have a few beers or, or a few glasses of wine and continue the conversation. So unfortunately, we cannot do that today. So all we can possibly do is have a really nice discussion about what really matters to us. That's what we're here. Um, and um, let's talk about um, crypto, clearly, uh, but also at the future of that um, and, and how it does have a future within the financial institution sector. So listen, I have you in order in my screen, Brianna, Kim and Simon. If that's OK, may I ask each one of you just to give me a couple of minutes intro about what are you doing, where you're working. Um, and it's always great as well to um, for the audience to hear, how did you get bitten by the blockchain bug? How did you get in to blockchain in the first place? So Mariana, can I give you the floor first? Sure, thanks. Thanks, Mai. Uh, very quickly about me, I'm the Executive Vice President for Operations at Crypto.com. Um, and I currently lead an insanely large team that deals with um, backend operations, anything from um, customer services to risk and fraud, uh, payments, reconciliation, operational compliance. Um, and um, my teams are spread across the globe. Um, I, I would really love to answer how did I go into crypto because it's, it's a very um, funny story, actually. I, I, I did have a very small investment in Bitcoin and I was practically freaking out about it because I wasn't sure if um, I made the right move there. And um, then I met CZ um, in early 2018 and somehow I ended up being the first person um, that set up the offices of finance in Europe. Um, and that's what really got me into crypto and, and got me very familiar with um, not just with everybody in the industry because it was still um, very small, I would say, although it was um, 10 years after Bitcoin popped up, uh, still it was a very nascent um, industry. Got to know a lot of people, got to know the business a lot better. And I told myself like only a couple of months after that it would be impossible for me to go back to financial services the way they were uh, because they don't make sense anymore. <laughs> Absolutely, I can I can understand that. I can totally understand that. Um, and you're not the first person to have said that to me. So um, I, yes, there's many many of us. Um, thank you, thank you, Mariana. Very interesting uh, story. Um, Kim, may I ask you to do the honors? Yeah, sure. Thanks, May. Um, <clears throat> yes, I work as a blockchain and cryptocurrency specialist at Rabel Bank at this moment. Um, and I did a lot of different blockchain projects from self-software and identity to tokenization. But at this moment and for the last two years, I only focused on crypto. At the moment, unfortunately, um, all the Dutch banks don't have crypto services <clears throat> in their portfolio. But that does not mean that we don't look into the crypto world, what is happening around us. What are our clients doing and are there possibilities maybe to start offering crypto services as well? 
Um, so that's, yeah, I always say pretty, pretty nice job in a traditional finance um, institution. Um, and I came across uh, blockchain and crypto five years ago during a lecture at the university. I was studying digital business uh, part-time besides my job. And one lecture was about blockchain for like 45 minutes. And it really uh, stole my heart. I really thought this is the future. What a nice technology. So many possibilities. And that was also um, the moment when I thought, okay, when I want to go into blockchain, I also need to buy some cryptocurrencies. So um, yeah, really cool. Very good. So it was love, love at first sight. Yes, it was love at first sight. Excellent. Thank you, Kim. Um, Simon, give us uh, two minutes on your journey, please. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so crypto uh, was not love at first sight for me, funny enough. Um, I touched crypto in 2011 in Berlin, um, which was a bit early maybe. And then I was like, ah, I should do more about this. But then uh, I was studying and yeah, I just lost it. And then it got me back in 2015. Um, but then more from the general like technology side, from the blockchain side. And I started to investigate use cases for Commerce Bank uh, back then, like analyzing 50 use cases for the bank, um, and then started uh, up in the newly founded Blockchain Lab. And from there on, then went to Deutsche Börse, and now I'm at Hauken Aufhäuser, a German private bank, and uh, I'm heading their department for digital assets, where we are building up own infrastructure along the whole value chain. So from custody, to portfolio management, everything that you could uh, think of in managing crypto assets. Very good, very good. So, um, excellent. Well, listen, thank you, thank you to the three of you. Um, the, the panel discussion title, um, the opportunities around crypto adoption for financial institutions. Um, it's a very, very large, broad title for the 45 minutes we have on a, on a Monday evening. Um, but very meaty one, I think very, very interesting one. So um, it talks about crypto, it doesn't say about digital assets. So I really like us to now discuss really about what we're talking about, these cryptocurrencies. I mean, you've all talked about it. I know you're head of digital assets, Simon, Kim, you've talked about cryptocurrencies, specifically looking at for, for Rabobank and Mariana, obviously because of your work and your experience in this last uh, 10 years. So. Um, my question, I suppose, would be first, um, maybe Mariana, uh, for you, why do you think that financial institutions would be wise to adopt crypto or to have a crypto strategy? As in, in a way, uh, yeah. So at, at one end, financial institutions, I think, have reached a level of development um, that already comprises of everything that they could possibly do on the market, the latest one being the open banking, right? If they want to develop any further, they have to utilize blockchain one way or another, whether they're going to take cryptocurrencies as a utility for blockchain, or they're going to build other products on a particular blockchain um, that may or may not be powered by cryptocurrencies, they still need to follow the trend because we all know that with Web 3.0, it may not come tomorrow, right? It's not one year away, maybe it's two, three years away, but when it comes, financial institutions uh, that do not develop their product to be based on a blockchain are simply going to fall out. And it's already very difficult, even from a PNL perspective, to run a PSP, right? Everybody has the same products and services. Everybody's charging a minimum margin. It's very difficult to find customers. The one way is, is to offer value and added value to your customers. And we all can see, it, it, it really struck me a couple of months ago, somebody told me um, that um, they asked me, how do you see yourself as a competitor of Revolut? How big of a competitor is Revolut? And I just, they're not a competitor. They have nothing to do with us. This is not someone that we even look into. And they were like, well, according to your users, you are a competitor of Revolut because Revolut sells crypto. And I tried to explain, it's not the same thing. You know, they don't own their keys or it's not, they, they can only sell that crypto back to Revolut. It's not the same thing. But for users, it is the same thing. So whether you do it in a completely vanilla way, whether you offer something like Revolut have, or you're going to go the full way and have a full ecosystem, whether through centralized applications or decentralized applications, you would still need to tap into that industry to stay adequate to everything that's happening around us. 
That's that's fantastic insight. Um, and and you're right. Um, so many users would just say crypto. Um, uh, Crypto.com is is just a direct competitor to to Revolut. So extending that um that challenge, I suppose, or that view, um, Kim, um, how would Rabobank see the likes of um of uh, crypto or Coinbase or Binance? Like, would you see those as competitors? Would you look at those as the uh, a business model to uh, to come in and adapt uh, to stay relevant. I mean, um, on, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think um, it is been seen as a direct competitor, but I think when you look clearly to what our clients are doing, they are into crypto. I read a research from last week in the Netherlands: one point two million Dutch people have crypto. So that is a lot. And all those um, uh, persons are not uh, having their crypto at a Dutch bank or uh, yeah, doing business uh, only with the bank accounts, just sending their euros away to a crypto exchange, like you mentioned. Um, and then it is out of our sight. And we, I think we are losing partly clients on that part. Um, I also saw Visa published uh, some sort of... Um, info last week about that clients are willing to change their bank if they uh, are offering crypto uh, services. So I thought it was like 20% or so. So I think that's really a high amount. So yes, I, I should say we offer a lot more, of course, uh, than the crypto exchanges are doing. So, but I think like Mariana said, I agree. Um, yeah, we are develop. yeah out developed or something like that uh, on the on the products we already have and if we want to be a part in this new digital world then yeah we should adopt it and i also agree what you said about the blockchain projects i see that myself every day um, one way or another we need to take the the crypto wheel as well to uh, to join yes and i would imagine thank you for that i'm sorry kim um at simon i would imagine uh, you'd have a similar position. Do you see pretty much what uh, Kim is seeing? Yeah, I think most obviously um, I can tell for sure, like within the existing industry, there's literally no bank with, let's say, more than 50 employees, I would say, that serves private clients with Bitcoin. Yeah, like we have now other players in the market and um, I think what we, what we see is basically that there is always need for financial services in crypto as well, but there is no need for a bank. And uh, this is something that I think we have to keep in mind. Financial services is a serving industry. We are offering services. We have to fulfill client needs. If we don't, we fail our job. And uh, clients obviously have a need to invest in crypto in different vehicles. So my conclusion is, until at least now, most of the banks have failed their job to be a financial service provider for the financial needs of a lot of customers. And here I'm completely with Kim. We now started to buy partially and build infrastructure for crypto specifically, and also investment vehicles, be it a crypto custodian, uh, according to the German license, um, be it setting up a fund uh, so that you can uh, invest in an actively managed crypto portfolio. <clears throat> I think these are needs for people that do not want to engage, for example, too much in crypto, but still see that there is um, market uh, homo heterogeneity yeah, that uh, one should um, recognize at least. And, and so for this reason, I would say, yes, the banks have failed their job, including what I have done previously to some extent. And this leads to them, and I'm here with Kim as well, losing clients, at least clients in crypto, for example, <clears throat> because there are other financial service providers that provide this very service that they need. And so they offer solutions for this need of their customers, which makes them the correct service provider. Yeah? And if the banks uh, do not come down from the high horse of saying like what is okay and what is not okay, but serving the clients in a proper and regulatory compliant way, of course, that they need, but not saying like this type of asset class is not 
regulatory compliance or won't do it, uh, they will simply go somewhere else. Yeah. Simon, very interesting and I think very insightful as well. Um, I think you're right and um, I think I'm not misquoting Bill Gates when he did say, what, 25, 30 years ago when we don't, we don't need um, banks but we do need banking. Um, and I think this is along the lines, um, we, certainly that, that need for that service is going to be there. I also do think there's lots of different nuances and different ways to attach that. So um, potentially, and so that maybe that's a question for you. Um, we tend to look at crypto and financial institutions in a very black and white uh, manner. So there is a bank, you need something, you need, you know, you, there's a payment, you need X. So it's, it's a quite a binary and black and white. Whereas um, with the acceptance of, of I would say retail acceptance of cryptocurrencies, even even DeFi, and I know that this panel discussion about DeFi, but as the as the DLT technology and application is moving and exploring new financial services, money and the services in financial services institutions is also changing. So it's potentially a case that in the future we might use different payment providers depending what the monies might be used for. The same way that we use different methods of transport depending on the distance. Um, and this is um, an idea that I wanted to float um, uh, say with all of you. Um, There's probably less about competition, but more about over time, um, actually building a niche for each one of those. So the crypto uh, might be used for something um, in a very specific way, and then other money or fiat money or whatever might be the future for something else. But this is looking at cryptocurrencies um, in the payment sphere, okay? Then we also have the investment fees, and then we have financial institutions that do invest in crypto. So, um, so crypto is a very high level um, title for lots and lots of layers underneath, and this is something that we need to be um, very cognizant, cognizant of. So let's, but let's back, bring it back to, to a level. Um, and I'm conscious there's a, there's a couple of questions there, but um, um, I, I totally agree. I think Chris Reed, I'm, I'm, I'm calling you out because your name has come up and that's a problem with virtual. I don't get to see your face and I, and I don't like to look at the audience and, and ask you questions, but we'll come back to you um, and your questions. I think you're, you're totally right, potentially, um, in terms of in the future financial institutions and um, and, and cast crypto asset service providers, there would be an element of, of, of merging potentially. But we'll come back to that. So let me park it for a little bit. Um, Mariana, can I come back to you again? Um, uh, you, you mentioned something that I thought was very, very interesting as well. And you talked about cryptocurrencies and the utility of cryptocurrencies. And this is a very important point because DLT and the cryptocurrencies are utility and the layer. And then that's very different from the cryptocurrency that's actually seen as a commodity, as an investment. So how do you see the potential for that? Let's decouple the cryptocurrency, the utility layer from the cryptocurrency, the investment case. And tell me, do you see either of them um, an, an opportunity for a financial institution? Um, and how would they go about to utilize it as an opportunity? So Perhaps it's best to also decouple what a financial institution would mean in that case. I'm, I'm going to take the European example since I sit in Europe and that's way easier for me. But if you look into financial institutions, these would normally have a financial institution license, which practically means payment services, then either the new PSD2, AISP and the PISP or an EMI um, company. Right. So if you look at these companies, the services that they have been authorized to provide play around the provision of payment services. We don't speak about investments, right? Investment services fall under MIFID, and these are not financial institutions. These are different kinds of institutions. So financial institutions would most likely go around the use case of payments, right? And I think this is the most, I, I wouldn't call it a failed attempt um, from a blockchain perspective, but this is the lesser, um, the, the, the less strong opportunity in crypto because Cryptocurrencies are still very volatile. A lot of people would love to pay for their goods in crypto. However, there are a couple of issues. One, 
is what happens if I keep, let's say, my money in F and then F depreciates because of um, market conditions and it just goes down and I no longer have 2,000 euros, I have um, 1,000 euro and this really is going to hurt my personal finances. So I don't want to be paying with my S because I'm, I'm just waiting for it to appreciate in value, then maybe turn it in stable coin, then maybe pay with it. Then there is a second thing, um, and that's regulation, right? Right now, uh, paying in crypto is um, actually frowned upon because um, regulators have no means to control that. So they have the means to control the investment side. And that's, I would say, already very well put into a framework that is going to be executed by introducing MICA. But then um, paying by crypto is still done in, um, I would say, less optimal way, right? Um, if you look at Australia, who are the first ones, I think, to introduce crypto payments, you were even able to pay your taxes and, and your utility bills in crypto. But the way this was done is technically you pay in crypto and then there is um, an exchange that takes your crypto, converts it to fiat and then pays your bills in fiat currencies. Um, same happens in merchant acquisition, right? Um, there are, we, for example, have um, a product that sits on one of our blockchains that offers merchants to accept crypto payments. But then again, these merchants can choose to have a fiat settlement. So we're still utilizing the bank network for that. Um, so we're only going halfway through. There isn't a full convergence between providing payment services in crypto and then taking a crypto settlement. And a lot of this, I, I think, has to come with market volatility and regulation per se. Um, I think financial services companies are um, more and more interested. Like we get a lot of companies interested in partnerships with us because they want to introduce crypto one way or another. They recognize the fact that they may not have um, necessarily the expertise they want to partner with someone who is strong in that and provide financial services added to it. But then there is the other point as well, right? A lot of the uh, crypto companies that actually wanted to build a sturdy business, just like crypto.com, it took us a while to get there, right? We started in 2016 and somebody would say, well, it took you five years to get where you are. But the reality is, if you want to exist in the future and you know that the future is going to be heavily regulated, you start preparing yourself very slowly by stepping on the footsteps of compliance, sturdy, sturdy compliance, getting those licenses takes a lot of time, as um, all of you know, because you come from regulated environments. So we took the very hard steps of first investing in a compliant platform and then ramping up the services um, in the last couple of years that we offered to form that ecosystem. Um, and a lot of, uh, I would say, the decent crypto companies would do the same thing, which kind of leaves financial services outside of this because once you have those licenses yourself, you're very unlikely to partner other financial institutions if you can close the circle and remove the intermediaries, which the blockchain is all about, right? Um, we speak about the removal of the intermediation. So I think the one way uh, financial institutions should go is to try and either partner smaller companies or just build the expertise on site so that they can, again, remain relevant in the services that they are authorized to offer or just get new licenses and go into a completely new line of business, which um, I think proves to be rather difficult, right? There is a huge difference between um, payment services directive and the markets and financial instruments directive is two separate business lines. Super fascinating. I think that's that's there's so many so many strands of conversation that um, we could pick up there. Particularly, I'm just in my mind. Uh, for example, um, um, this afternoon, I think it was uh, Beats, I think it was Beats Stamp, and um, they mentioned that um, 120 out of the 600 staff were actually just doing compliance. Yeah. Um, you know, which is huge. Uh, and then we are looking at Kim and Simon uh, and their respective banks. You know, I do even know, I mean, how many in comparison, um, how many people do you have in the banks? Um, because we know, and we know the regulated entities, compliance co compliance costs are high. Um, but yeah, even even with the technology and what it can do, um, clearly that there's a there's a huge ramp, um, I think, to um to to have to climb. Also, um, another something else has come up there as you were talking, Mariana, and you mentioned about partnering, for example, and uh, it's come up in one of the questions as well. There's a two-way street, I think, in, in, in this case, right? In some cases, you mentioned, Mariana, financial institutions reaching out to crypto.com 
with potentials uh, to partner because they don't have that uh, crypto services um, um, experience in house uh, to bring that in. Um, and Kim and Simon, I don't know, maybe you, maybe your respective financial institutions are building out that that um, that staff, that knowledge, with the potential maybe to go back out. But I was just wondering. Um, there's also um, an element of mistrust of financial institutions, right? And this is a challenge back to one of the questions from, from the audience. Um, you, meant, <clears throat> you mentioned, Kim, that 20% um, uh, um, of uh, Dutch people, I think, would be willing to change the bank if they offered crypto, right? So uh, how, many, how many crypto holders would be willing to, to change bank if the bank started to offer it? Um, what's the element of trust? So some people mistrust financial institutions because of what happened 10 years ago, because of the financial crisis, um, and they're willing and happier to actually have control of, of, of their uh, cryptocurrencies or of their financial um, uh, well-being. Um, so I just think it's a little bit of who would be providing um, reputation services to whom? Would it be the traditional bank? Um, you know, bringing in a crypto service in house to appear to be cool, to you know, to to kind of uh, to really modernize themselves and and set forth, would that be detrimental? You know, like would cryptocurrency holders want to have that partnership, or would it be decoupled from from um, from a financial institution? What do you think, Kim? What do you think, Simon? Yeah, I think um, I think it's yeah. It's in separate ways. Uh, you can see this, right? I think there's a large uh, amount of people that already already found their way. So to Crypto.com, to Binance, to other uh, Dutch players, for example, that also have uh, a license at the at the Dutch Central Bank. Um, that part maybe is okay with that. Want to stay at their um, at their provider as they are uh, happy with it, maybe right now. But I also still think there's a large amount, as I speak for the Netherlands, that yeah is not so sure about the provider that yeah they bought their cryptos at and um, is not so sure how to safe store their crypto assets uh, on a ledger, for example, or another hardware wallet. Or there's also a lot of people that lost their keys. You know, I think that's still a large amount. So on the one hand, you have the people that say. I will be my own bank and I don't want to have crypto services at the traditional uh, bank. But um, yeah, we researched already, I think three years ago um, ourselves, how the market was moving back then. And we wanted to start crypto services, but back then, yeah, the Dutch regulators were uh, not willing us to do that. So that's why we uh, did not proceed. Um, but yeah, clients were already uh, telling us back then that they lost their keys, that they are not so sure what to do in the market, etc. So yeah, may I'm, I'm not sure what the percentages will be, but there, yeah, there will be divided. But, listen, like Kim, I think that's very interesting, and um, I, I mean exactly. I mean, you, you're talking to to your market, and I do think there's an element of very different uh, nations have very different levels of financial literacy. They have very different um, levels of cryptocurrency adoption and, and reasons of being so, yeah. So what's happening you know, in Salvador or Venezuela, for example, is totally different to uh, say uh, a nation like Japan, which they were really in uh, on the Bitcoin very earlier on, and they might not be um, as comfortable or as willing maybe to to accept um, and invest in it in another cryptocurrency. So I. I really appreciate the insight to the, to the Dutch market. I think it's important because we do tend to uh, gener gener generalize, uh, speaking general terms when we talk about crypto, but we're all quite individuals and we do uh, live in, in a society environment. And I, and I do think that um, trust in government, trust in, in the banking um, services, even your experience with the financial services, I think they're all obviously uh, determinant um, as to whether um, you're happy to just do, do your crypto services yourself or uh, trust it to a trusted bank. Okay, so like an example here in Ireland, um, there was a research piece done last year. Um, a lot of young people were happy to, say, uh, become um, customers of Revolut because they didn't want to bank with the same bank that their mom and dad were banking. So, uh, you know, this is just a totally, you know, a very unique maybe thing to, to, to our jurisdiction here. But I think that uh, um, that's an, a, a cultural element to it that's very, that's definitely interesting. Um, Simon, what, what do you think about this? Do you think that um, 
your entity selling cryptos, would that be seen as a cool thing to do? Um, do you think that uh, it would work the other way around? What's your experience? Uh, we, we are starting to offer different products for making crypto investable for our clients. I think what you stated before um, is quite important that there is not a common client. I think every client has their individual needs. There are clients that have similar needs that makes it easier to target them. And that's why different banks have different target groups. For us as a private bank, a regular retail client is simply not the target group. Um, this makes our service differ from other bank services because our service is much more tailor-made to some extent. So if we go into the crypto space, um, why as you discussed before, like who's your competitor? Why is Revolut a competitor? Because it fulfills similar client needs, right? And it addresses similar target groups maybe. <clears throat> and for us, also a crypto solution is maybe to some extent their need. And especially as we also target, let, let's say like mid, mid to small sized um, in clients as well, that of course here, the client needs are completely different uh, from the one of a, a private client. Yeah? And a, a larger family office wants to invest in products that completely differ from a product that a private client wants to invest in. So our job is to tailor products to the client needs in crypto as well. And uh, I think a common misconception here is that uh, crypto is a totally different animal and everything's different. Yeah, I, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, uh, there are similarities between crypto and existing asset classes. There are difficulties that are special uh, to crypto, of course, especially when it comes to, for example, as you've mentioned, custody for what we in regular business call corporate actions. Yeah, corporate action in crypto is a fork handling. Yeah, not so many financial institutions yet being familiar with how to handle a fork. Uh, you have to teach them. Yeah? And if you teach them, then they already know, okay, it's maybe similar to a, a volunteer with a corporate action or a fund. And then if you're setting up a fund, for example, where crypto is being owned, of course, you have to handle fork, you do a fork handling as well. But then ultimately for the client, it's a position in the account. And for most of the clients, <coughs> the need to invest in crypto is to have it in their portfolio at least. And uh, their will to to move somewhere else only to invest in crypto already shows the potential that the asset class has. Now, what if they could simply just stay maybe for a bit of higher fees yeah, and not have to keep accounts separately, uh, separately for another asset class? So uh, what I see as a job is like make crypto investable yeah, for our clients in the way that they need it yeah, and in a way that it's um, convenient. Yeah? Why do private clients go to something like Revolut or I think personally, to be honest, the Trade Republic has done it very well because there it's also in your portfolio only. And then we also see that the clients ultimately do not care maybe about the best price or whatsoever in the market if it's convenient. Yeah. A lot of crypto solutions out there simply due, its, due to its novelty are very convenient in how it's being handled. For an institutional client, convenient means that it's part of his portfolio, that he still gets his tax services and that he can still simply book it into his accounting system. That's convenient for an institutional client, very different from convenient for a private client. Yeah? And so we have to uh, differentiate the market groups I think banks will have to investigate what is our current uh, target group in terms of customers. Do we still want to target them or are we losing existing ones? Even maybe, do we want to target additional? Then maybe we do need to offer a different solution even because our current product portfolio is not even tailored and the people are not tailored. So then you need a really different organization. And that's when banks start to buy other companies. Yeah, uh, For us, <coughs> we have partially bought companies Partially, we are building up on products. For the own products, it has to fit the existing infrastructure, including the target client group. For a new target client group, maybe I need another infrastructure. It might make sense to partner by. Very, listen, very, very useful, insightful, and I think you're 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 totally right. I mean, at the end of the day, um, financial institutions have shareholders, they have a PL, uh, products have to make sense. So not only in revenue terms, but also in terms of value offered to, to those customers. Um, 
And on that, there's uh, Michael Astor just put in a, a quick question there directed to Kim and Simon, but maybe I'll ask you, Simon, to answer it first, because I think it's uh, it links to what you're just mentioning there. Um, what kind of projects are you working on to get blockchain, or I would say crypto, into the site of the regular portfolio of the organization? I think you've answered that in terms of um, looking at what the customer wants and particularly looking at private clients. Um, would you be able to give one example, Simon, and then maybe I'll pass it on to Kim? So, so an example of our product, basically? What? Uh, yeah, sorry, it's in the questions. Uh, what kind of projects are you working yeah, on yeah. to get crypto? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So um, we are setting up a, a fund uh, for making crypto investable for our clients. We are investigating at least um, how to issue a note because there might be different... Um, uh, a different target group that prefers that. We have bought a crypto custodian and are thinking about uh, making it possible um, to to um, also make direct investments in crypto available via the crypto custodian. And within the uh, Manco that will issue the fund, we're also setting up capabilities to offer basically everything in the value chain from portfolio management only to issuing for a third party a crypto fund to maybe doing like only crypto custody and um, depository services. That's that's very useful. That's very useful insight. So when you meant to fund, um, Simon, uh, do you have a particular cryptocurrency in mind? Um, like, would it be largely be Bitcoin, or is it a case that you're still exploring that? Here we have. Um, I mean, the current limitation might be simply the kind of tokens that are. Uh, um, or assets that are already connected in terms of the custodian because you have to put it in custody as well with the custodian. But here we are not focusing on singular assets. I guess that we will have at least 10 uh, crypto assets in the portfolio uh, for the beginning and we'll actively manage that. With We have two open positions currently, one a portfolio manager for crypto specifically and uh, an analyst for crypto. And uh, so they will basically actively manage the portfolio uh, within the scope of at least 10, 10 currency assets. Very good. So any of you listeners, um, there's jobs there to be had. Call Simon after this. Uh, very good. I like that, Simon. Um, Kim, tell us, um, any specific projects that you'd like to um, give us an insight so we, we, we see how Rabobank is um, um, capitalizing on the opportunities of crypto for, for the institution. Yes, I think it all starts with knowledge, right? And um, when our blockchain team started five years ago, it was fully focused on blockchain and not so much on crypto. So I think for the last couple of two, two and a half years, we are focusing more on crypto. So it has all a lot to do with sharing knowledge, um, Yeah, present a lot to important stakeholders within the organization. Um, so we also set up a crypto board where uh, different expertises come together. So compliance, legal risk, but also our KYC department, what are our clients doing in our uh, daily lives with crypto and what kind of cases do we see? So we discuss that um, every two weeks. So that's really uh, on a high frequency. And we see that yeah, more and more colleagues as well are gaining more knowledge around this topic. So I think that's a really good thing. And also, yeah, a basis you need to at least start crypto projects. Um, and for myself, I researched a lot of custody providers last year and also, yeah, seeking for opportunities to start with uh, for Rainbow Bank. Um, and uh, I had the opportunity uh, to present about the world of crypto and decentralized finance at our managing board uh, last month. So that was really cool. So um, at least I've been at the highest level of the organization to tell them what's happening in the crypto world, what our clients are doing and yeah, what we as a tech lab should do um, into next steps. And that's a part I cannot tell you a lot about, no. but uh, <laughs> at least we are researching the possibilities. You're researching the possibilities. Okay, very good. I mean, and having this conversation at C-suite level, obviously, I think it's totally part of that uh, um, of that potential crypto adoption, uh, certainly for financial institutions. You know, the uh, the decision makers at the level, and certainly those that manage risk within a financial institution, need to understand and be educated in terms of what crypto is and 
it definitely isn't. Um, very good. Mariana, um, maybe I, I'll turn that question around to you. I mean, you, you're, you're seeing things completely from the, from the other perspective. And, and, and I'm sorry, because we did have Stephanie from Gemini, who was meant to join this panel uh, discussion. But unfortunately, um, um, she, she is an, um, unwell to be able to join it. So it's, it, it falls squarely on your shoulders, uh, Mariana. So from, from the cryptocurrency asset provider uh, uh, point of view, how do you go about, you offer your services, do you consider um, financial institutions are doing this, that, that's not what we're going to do? Is it a case of, you know what you're doing, you know your clients, you're going ahead. Um, it's not so far that you're looking for partnerships or m and um, activity potentially to, um, to, to go hand in hand with your business. Um, what's your strategy maybe in the short term? You guys are very clear in terms of what your markets are and you continue with this. Tell us. Um, so since inception, right, I think Crypto.com was very, very different from the native crypto companies that were existing at the time. Because if you look at Kraken and the likes, they all started as crypto exchanges, whereas Crypto.com actually started as a payments company. The first product um, that evolved around the crypto ecosystem was the Crypto.com card. That card was done with a cooperation with Visa and the people that the, the initial team um, that was gathered had a lot of specialists that came um, from Visa, from MasterCard, people with financial services background. So we started as a crypto-backed payments company. So for us, the journey was always very different since day one. What we had in mind is to proliferate the usage of crypto across the world to, to just facilitate the adoption of crypto. We wanted to see cryptocurrency in every wallet, right? This was our motive. To do that, you have to start with a product that in the beginning resembles something that users wanted. We have always had in mind to create a crypto ecosystem that comprises of all use cases of finance. So we were never going to limit ourselves just to a product um, that resembles new banks so that people can sign up. That's just the beginning. The centralized front end has always been just a way to show people that it's not so different. As Simon said, it's not so different. These asset classes are just a new way to call um, a certain asset class, but it resembles currencies, it resembles commodities, it resembles securities. So it's not so different to work with it. You just have to um, pretty much put behind the bias of, oh, I'm not tech savvy. I don't know if I'm going to be able to even sign up, go through KYC. I don't know what to do with this. It actually resembles any card that you have. Having um, set the foot at, okay, we're going to start uh, with, with crypto adoption, the easy way to get the people who are most difficult to convert, not not the crypto fanatics, but people who are a little bit later, uh, later in, in the adoption curve. And then we started adding more advanced products. So then came the exchange and obviously trading on an exchange. I, I know crypto, I think, did a lot for the financial literacy of people overall, because many um, private investors, or not private, but like retail investors, were never investing in stock before in their life. Their first investment purchase was in crypto. Um, so people got financially richer, um, not just in terms of money, but also in terms of knowledge. Then we started doing the DeFi projects and built our own blockchain and recently um, launched the first DeFi project on our Kronos blockchain. That already is for more advanced users, but for, what we're trying to say is you have a full ecosystem. You have every use case that you could possibly have. You can enter at any stage that you like. Maybe you're an advanced user and you just want to join a liquidity pool and um, have some really fancy APY and earn from the cryptocurrencies you already have. Or maybe you just want to own some Bitcoin because you heard that it's going to reach um, massive uh, value in 2023 and you want to be part of it. You can do either. You don't have to choose. You can enter at, at any point of that ecosystem. So this is what we're trying to build, to create a real community, to be a real participant in building Web 3.0. You have to allow different participants to access at a different point. Um, I saw um, a question in the audience uh, that went around DeFi and the importance um, of DeFi in the future services and in the marginal communities. It's insanely important, right? It's a permissionless 
um, application. You can enter without KYC, so you can potentially sit in a country um, that the US does not favor that much, uh, and usually you get denied uh, onboarding at centralized exchanges. You don't even have to have native crypto right now. Um, you can also buy with your credit cards and certain DeFi applications, right? And you can enter um, that ecosystem. You can maybe make a little bit more by participating in, in lending pools, or you can maybe, um, you know, even get a loan yourself to invest any further. It all helps you develop first your mind and your edu educationally, it, it's priceless. Because to enter um, a DeFi ecosystem or a centralized one even, you still need to familiarize yourself with how all of this works. And ultimately, it leads to, um, puts you closer to, let's say, financial independence. Maybe not in all cases, everybody would be so lucky to actually reach a financial independence stage. But it opens up doors in uh, literally every corner of the world. That being said, of course, Again, it's going to be heavily regulated. That's why DeFi right now plays a huge role. I think DeFi, in a way, will be self-regulated moving forward. There are talks in the US that this is going to um, be the next thing in DeFi. But even so, if you look at the convergence between financial services and maybe DeFi applications, I totally see how banks or financial institutions can be the forefront of these services. And the services will be run on a DeFi application on the back end. So you would still have this fully compliant front end, but actually be able to offer the, the fancier services that a DeFi application can give you access to. That's uh, super insightful, Mariana. And um, um, I think your last comment is really interesting. And I think it would be great for us to, uh, to bring in um, the DeFi. It's in the comments. Um, I didn't want to get too deep into it because we know we have very dedicated uh, DeFi sessions in EBC over the next couple of days as well. But um, you've spoken to DeFi um, in crypto.com. You obviously have the products. You mentioned how they're probably more for the um, uh, bit more, I would say, expert or a bit more um, sophisticated investor of sorts. And a very recent um, chain analysis uh, report showing out the DeFi adoption um, was actually showing a really high level, actually the, the largest DeFi market in the world being concentrated in Europe um, and Asia being the second, which I think is quite interesting. Now, that seems or it speaks to me to institutional adoption of DeFi. It doesn't speak to me to the um, moms and pops and you know young people actually getting into DeFi just yet. Um, I think it's, it's certainly not the case. And, and the channel analysis, analysis report pointed out to institutional investors of, you know, 10,000, sorry, $10 million, um, which is quite a big, you know, it's a big chunky uh, transaction level, certainly not something I'd have in the back of my pocket. So uh, Kim and Simon, when it comes to DeFi, um, is that step too far for your institution in, in terms of looking at crypto adoption? Is this um, at the moment um, reserved, as uh, Mariana has mentioned, maybe to the most sophisticated and bold investors? Um, are your financial institutions maybe exploring or waiting and see approach? What do you think, Kim? Um, yes, of course, at our team, we are exploring this field as well because it is in line with crypto. Um, I really think when yeah, traditional institutions want to do something with DeFi, it must start somewhere with providing crypto services, a custody service, things like that to offer, yeah, DeFi on the other side because traditional central institutions are not decentralized finance institutions, but they can offer their clients a way to that world. And um, I also believe that yeah, financial institutions might have an important role over there. Also on the education side, on yeah, what is this all about? You know, I think a lot of people are into crypto and DeFi, not knowing what they are doing um, and not knowing what kind of protocols and what kind of code is beneath the, the platform they are using. Um, so yeah, that might be a possibility. And I really think, um, yeah, it's good to look into that. And um, within our team, we are researching, uh, of course, this field. Thanks, Kim. What about you, Simon? So for me personally, um, banks, especially that are strong in advisory services, are in a great position to be a gateway into DeFi, even though it might look 
ironic. Um, I mean, uh, the whole concept of DeFi was like directly giving access, but to be honest, it's quite technical. Now there are a lot of startups being founded to making DeFi access less technical. And it's the very same development as with crypto in the beginning, right? Um, people who needed to get an own wallet needed to be tech savvy in the beginning. They had to set it up. Uh, some regular guy that's not in IT, a regular woman that's not in IT, they might not be able to set up a wallet, right? And to download a full node or a flash node or whatsoever, yeah? And um, so, so we see now companies building up that need that is upcoming, yeah, to cover that need. And if there are clients of us that want to in somehow invest in something that is connected to DeFi, they have to get access. So for it's a prime position to provide them with access. <clears throat> the difficulty now is banks starting to build up infrastructure for the crypto side where they have kind of lost track at least the last years. Now DeFi is around the corner. Explain to your board members why you now need the money for the crypto side and the DeFi and by the way, also electronic securities that are also upcoming, especially in the German regulation with the uh, Elect uh, Electronic Security Act. And then you say, oh, I need all of this. And then they say like, okay, you, I think you should focus a bit. And you're like, yeah, but you need the crypto stuff because they're already gone. And you need the security stuff because that's your home turf and the electronic fund shares, by the way, as well. And then you'll say, okay, you need also to prepare for DeFi. And then they say, maybe, uh, look, I already built a, a 20 people department for you uh, in a bank that's not too large. Um, so uh, I think you should better be a bit calm and uh, finish your stuff first and then go into the DeFi space. And that's the difficulty, I, I guess. Um, even so, I would say our house, for example, is quite bullish on it, and especially from the board side, really, with actual belief in that this is a disruptive and innovative technology. Um, it's still hard uh, uh, out of a running business, like not separately funding it from outside as an own kind of business. Um, to, to hear kind of tackle everything. And that's also a difficulty of banks because banks regularly want to fulfill all their customer needs, of course. And that's also very much sales driven. But if you look uh, how, how different startups are approaching it, there are startups that are dealing only with crypto custody software. Then there are startups that are doing the crypto custody itself. Then there are startups that are specializing into DeFi. Then there are startups that are specializing into tokenization. Then there are startups that are uh, doing specialization in uh, token analysis and chain analysis. Yeah. And so um, if you are now coming as a bank and saying that oh, we won't do everything, then it will be quite hard to do this and you won't get it funded as well. We said this before, like in, in a startup, you have maybe like hundreds of people ultimately that are dealing only with crypto compliance. And then I'm coming along and saying, look, uh, I managed to get a one crypto compliance uh, full position yeah, for, for, for the bank. That's already quite impressive, but they have like 30 people over there. Yeah? Why? It's a separately funded own company with own structure that's purely focusing on this one business goal and personal purpose. So my takeaway is <coughs> we have to address DeFi. It's at the core of my belief that it's a prime uh, a position for being a gateway into DeFi for a regular bank. The question will be in what speed can I take the bank with myself to provide which kind of services at, at which point in time and with, with which urgency? And um, this is a difficult question, which I'm getting paid for. So I'll have after. Very good, Simon. Yeah. Um, Very good. Listen, Simon, I, I yeah, think so Victoria, Victoria showing up with her ray of light and I have to stop you there. Yeah. But um, I have a solution for you, Simon. We need to get all your board in the bank free tickets to attend the next EBC. And then you'll get all the funding you want for all the DeFi projects, because then they'll get to know what it's all about. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's my solution for you. Um, listen, um, yeah, Victoria shows up, which means ah, we run out of time, which is I'm sorry, because um, I could if we were in Barcelona or in Denmark right now having this in the flesh, we'd be going off, as I said, to the bar, having a few um, vinos and we continue to talk. Absolutely. I've learned so much from you guys. I've taken a few words to summarize our discussion and about the opportunities of uh, around crypto adoption for financial institutions. I've taken convergence as a big word. So we're not talking about dying and we're not talking about taking over. We're not talking about any sort of 
I think conversions is a good way. I think there's, there's an element of, of the two elements um, on the crypto side of the financial institutions coming together. Um, I've taken the not crypto, crypto's not so different. Um, famous words from Simon. I totally love that the way you said that. It totally, it starts to feel it's not that different when you start really understanding some of the products there. Um, I like the uh, giving what users want. I think this is very important because at the end of the day, the, what users want, and to Mariana's point, um, the DLT technology allows for that universal participant access, which is something that sometimes financial institutions have lost um, a way to, 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 to provide to each one of us. So with that mini summary, a huge thank you to Mariana, Kim and Simon. We did miss Stephanie, but um, you did fantastically well. I learned so much. And thanks for the audience for the amazing photo, uh, questions. Um, and until next time, and thanks Victoria for this chance to, uh, to participate in the VC again. Thank you everyone. Thank you, my thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Simon. Thanks, thank you Kim. Yeah, I think it was an amazing way to wrap up the day. And well, we still have four days to go, so uh, that's amazing. You know, uh, you can all reach out to to the speakers, Mariana, Simon, Mai, and Kim via the People's Tab. And also, you cannot. I mean, not just it's not just about reaching out to the speakers. It's also about reaching out. Uh, out to people between you, some of the other um, oh, <laughs> attendees. So make sure to network. You know, tomorrow we're starting again at 12 Central European time. So you have the whole morning, morning to do networking. So make sure to do networking. At the end of the day, you know, it's very important for us that you learn through the European Black Convention and that you connect with whoever you need to meet and to make sure that you reach the next step uh, within your uh, within your project. I don't know, maybe you're looking for a new employee, maybe you're looking for an investor, maybe you're looking for a client. They're all there. So again, thank you so much to the four of you. Amazing way of ending up the first day of the European Black Dimension 6th edition. Bye-bye, everyone.